Uh, good afternoon and happy Sabbath to all. Um, happy Sabbath. Thank you. Um, this is the day of the Lord's victory. Let us be happy and let us celebrate. May God bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And um, it's the Lord. I would like to extend a warm and hearty welcome to all of you. Hope you will all have a blessed Sabbath day. May God bless us all as you ponder on his message from his messenger. Thank you. For opening him, we will use all oh, have our love. <laughs> Scripture reading from Pastor. Scripture reading is found in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, a very common uh, verse in Scripture, in which you know it by heart, and many of you know it by heart. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good. To those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. May the Lord add meaning to his word. It's time to pray. Let's all close our eyes and take a reverent position where possible. Let's pray. A most gracious only Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessings, O Lord, that you have best upon us throughout the past week. Thank you for uh, taking care of us. Thank you for providing us with all sorts of necessities. Thank you for protecting us from all sorts of harms and dangers. Moreover, Father, thank you for the privilege and the opportunity which you have given to us as a family to come to thy presence, to bring honor, glory, and praise unto thy name. O oh Lord, we come to thy feet with heart full of gratitude, thankfulness and sincerity. We humble ourselves in front of you, Father. Have mercy, have mercy, have mercy on us. Especially, Father, we 
thank thee for the manifold blessings for the very life. Thank you for the word which you have given to us. Thank you for this blessing on the Sabbath day to discuss thy word and to learn and to equip ourselves. We pray and remember about our the people who are sick, poor and needy, O oh Lord, take care of them. People who are suffering due to natural disasters, calamities, wars, take care of them, O oh Lord. We pray and remember about people who are suffering due to job losses, stress, no food, water, and shelter, especially during this pandemic period, take care of them, Father. We pray for the church at large, be with the ministers, pastors, members, and workers of law. Thank you for the commission which you have given to us. Help all of us to be part of that commission. We also pray for the speaker of this hour. Be with him, Father. The things, the message which we are going to hear, help us to be a comfortable message and to inculcate in ourselves, Father. Moreover, Father, we ask thee for the forgiveness from our sins which we are doing knowingly and unknowingly, Father. Have mercy on us. May the thinking of our thoughts via our mind and things which we see our by our through our eyes and the things which we hear or listen by our ears and the words which we speak through our mouth and tongue, and the things which we do with our hands, the places where we go, our legs may bring honor and glory unto thy name. May this worship bring glory and honor unto thy name and a blessing upon us. And finally, O oh Lord, when the sun comes in the clouds of heaven, may we all have a place in the eternal kingdom. For as these blessings in the name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Children's story will be brought to us by Pastor Dan. Good to see everyone and hope you are well. Well, today I thought I would talk about something the kids have been asking me, and that is why? Why is all of this happening? I thought I would tackle that today because right now things really just, they don't make a whole lot of sense. Things are changing. Things are different. Here's some other things that don't make a whole lot of sense. Here's the first one. Yeah, I don't know about you, but that makes no sense to me. Yeah, none. Not, not even a little bit. Nope. Here's something else that doesn't make a lot of sense. Take a look at this. This is the New Testament of the Bible in Greek. In Greek. Yeah, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. At least not yet. <laughs> so those things don't make a whole lot of sense either. Just like life right now just does not make a whole lot of sense to many of us. These past weeks, we have been living in a time where we are looking to God and going, Lord, you up there? Lord, Lord, do you see what's happening down here? Look, look, none of this makes sense. Why do we have to go through all of this? When will this end? Why do bad things happen to good people? Does not make sense. Unfortunately, bad things happen to good people, to all people. They happen to everyone. Even Jesus himself in John said, you will have suffering in this world. He said it himself. 
I bet you can think of something that hasn't gone according to plan, can you? Take a second, see if you can think of something that, that didn't go so well. Yeah, I can think of many. I can think of many times where things were really hard and that we really suffered. But why? Why do we go through all of this? Well, my short answer is, we live in a broken world full of sin. A broken world full of sin. But there is some really good news. In Romans 8.28, it says that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. One of my favorite verses of all time. Let me read it again. Romans 8.28 says, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. It doesn't say in the good times, God works for the good of those who love him. It says in all times. In the bad times, the really tough times, the times where we cry and we scream and we say, God, why? He is working for our good, even in those times. But what does that really mean? Here, let me show you. So I want you to pretend you're this beautiful piece of paper. Here you are, here you are. Orange piece of paper. Beautiful. Everything's going great. There's so much potential here. You could be anything. You could be anything. But then, what am I supposed to do with that? Just like in life, bad things happen that we don't know what to do with. Same thing. What am I supposed to do now? How am I supposed to be anything when all of this bad is happening? Well, like I told you, God takes those things that are bad, intended for harm, and he has this magical way of using them for good. So he takes what's left of this and he says, I can work with that. I can work with that. And so he starts his work in us. When we accept Jesus into our hearts and into our lives, he says, I can work with that. And he starts work in us if we allow him to. That is the key. He starts this work in us. And over time, as he continues this work in us, and he takes us down these different paths, we stop along the way and we go, Lord, what are you doing here? I, do, I don't know where you're going with this. But we trust him and we keep on going. And he takes those things that are supposed to break us. They're supposed to tear us down. And he uses them to give us things like perseverance and endurance and all these wonderful traits that make us into even better people that look a little bit more like Jesus. And then over time, as he continues to work in us, he takes those things that were meant for bad, finds something incredibly good in each of us. Look at that, a beautiful bird. He takes things that were meant for harm and he finds the good. He works for the good of those who love him. So if we allow him, Jesus will take us and shape us and guide us, even through those really rough times. And look, he finds the beauty. All right, before we go, Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Dearest Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the time to be together. And Lord, please protect each and every one of us as we go through this coronavirus pandemic, Lord. May we be healthy and may we be your hands and feet amidst all of this. We ask this in your name and for your sake. Amen. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me. So
thank you. Uh, as part of um, the protocol, uh, it's the time for the introduction of a uh, speaker. I think we all very well know uh, Pastor Dan. Um, uh, personally, uh, I think on a personal perspective, um, I have um, acquaintance or know Pastor Dan for the past eight to nine years. When I initially came to UK and when I was attending my very first church uh, at West Bromwich, um, I think at uh, the time Renilda was born, she was year one here. A uh, few uh, a few things uh, I will say about Pastor Dan. Uh, humble, uh, available, always approachable, uh, inspiring. Uh, he's a man of God. Um, whenever we call him um, in our previous uh, prayer meetings or home uh, worships or programs, he never said no as far as I'm aware. Uh, and also, um, I don't know whether uh, this is the right thing uh, or appropriate uh, way to say, but uh, I will, this is just an acknowledgement. Uh, as, a, as Pastor Dan also came from overseas, uh, he's, he has done a great job in his ministry in and around the West Midlands. So uh, whenever I hear about Pastor Dan, I always look forward to um, hear his um, voice, which he proclaims a word of God. Um, we will hear uh, from Pastor Dan now. Uh, before that, a, a meditational song will be played. Thank you.
Amen. Some of those are my friends. They came from the college where I uh, graduated. Um, before in that college, there were more than 12 different choirs or singing groups. Advent Philomels, that we heard today, was one of them. I tried to join the choir, I mean, the uh, just different singing groups, because they sing beautifully. I tried to um, have a audition, and I auditioned for tenor. And unfortunately, I was not accepted. Um, <clears throat> the group was allowed Arvinses. I still remember that, the Arvinses. And um, unfortunately, I was trying to, I did not sing, I didn't know how to sing. Uh, you must sing from your diaphragm and not from the neck. And I didn't know those techniques before. And so, unfortunately, I, I did not pass the audition. They asked me to sing again and again, my Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. And, and the, uh, the director was, you know, trying to coach me, but I couldn't get it. So um, I never had uh, to audition again. I, I, was, uh, I, I, was, I was put down, but uh, fortunately, I was accepted in the choir because the choir was a requirement for us. It's a church choir, it's a requirement in our music subject. Um, our colleagues had a very different program from, uh, for the theology department. They teach us philosophy of health, they teach us anatomy and physiology, all these other things, because uh, including music as well, that we have to uh, know how to compose or whatever and we have to join the choir. And so I was accepted in the choir because it was part of the requirements that I was singing in the church choir along with others. But um, it's nice to see my old friends. Uh, they're all over the world now, but they just put together that song in a cappella. So there is no slap in YouTube for that. So um, I would like to thank uh, Brother Rakesh who uh, introduced me so kindly. Uh, but generously, let us have a word of prayer before we begin. Our Heavenly Father, we are going to study your word at this time. We pray that even though this is a very common text or passage of scripture, that we will still open our eyes and see in a different view uh, your word for us today. So we may learn something. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. I do not have to tell you that Romans 8.28 is one of the most beloved verses in Scripture. You know that. And many of you give testimonies to the fact you were ill and this verse was like a medicine to your soul. You lost a loved one, and these words somehow carried you through with the hope. You were crushed and beaten by the winds of difficult circumstances, and this verse give you hope to go on. But there are some sincere and thinking people today who honestly doubt about this particular text. This verse, instead of a bomb to the soul, becomes a mocking, cruel joke. They ask, what do you mean by good? Sickness is not good. Murder is not good. Divorce is not good. Rape is not good. The death of a child or a family member is not good. COVID-19 is not good. So can we still believe Romans 8.28? Now we have to admit that this verse sometimes is misused. And well-meaning Christians sometimes throw it at the face of those who are suffering as if it could answer every question of life. When it is misused that way, it produces the opposite effect that the Apostle Paul intended. But whether we like it or not, it's in the Bible, and it won't go away. Which brings us back to the basic question, can we still believe in Romans 8, 28? You see, it takes faith and reason to believe and conclude that all things work together for good. Now, the writer of Romans is also the writer of Hebrews, and he talks about faith in Hebrews 11:24 and 25. 
by faith Moses when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now, I would like to walk with you in the experience of Moses. I believe his life's narrative is very helpful for us to understand Romans 8, 28 better. Now, Moses' life is divided into three symmetrical thirds, 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in Median, and another 40 years between Egypt and Canaan. Now, for the first 40 of Moses' life, you know how the story goes. He is born at the time of a decree from Pharaoh to kill every male child born to Israelite slaves in Egypt. His parents defy Pharaoh's command by keeping his birth secret. And by the time Moses is three months old, his mother cannot hide him anymore. She makes a watertight boat of reeds and puts Moses in it. And she commits him to God and hides the little boat in the bushes along the river's edge. The big sister Miriam stays nearby to see what will happen. And soon, Pharaoh's daughter, coming down to the river, discovers him. She knows at once that this is a Hebrew child. And in her sympathy, she decides to adopt a baby and brings him up as her own. Now, Miriam comes in, offers to get a nurse for the child from among the Hebrews. Jochebed, the mother, becomes that nurse. And for 12 precious years, she has her son Moses safe in her arms. No one could hurt the baby boy anymore because he is the son of Pharaoh's daughter, Pharaoh's instant grandson. All the other Hebrew male babies are dead, but Jochebed's son Moses is spared. So fortunate to be chosen to nurse her own son. And on top of that, she gets paid. Now, do you get paid for raising your own kids? You see, this is not a luck. This is divine providence. Now, after Moses is weaned, he goes to live in Pharaoh's own court and becomes a prince. He learns to speak the proper Egyptian language, attends the ancient equivalent of Harvard or Oxford University. He wears the splendor of royal princely clothing. He masters royal manners and etiquette. He plays polo, squash, golf, takes fencing and goes to Taekwondo, Taibo and Judo classes. So at the age of 40, Moses is the master of the universe, so to speak. Ear to the Egyptian throne, he is trained in the wisdom of the Egyptians, in science, in mathematics, medicine, astronomy, military strategy, philosophy, history, theology, law, economics and architecture. Moses was fitted to take preeminence among the great of the earth, to shine in the courts of its most glorious kingdom, and to sway the scepter of its power. His intellectual greatness distinguishes him above the great men of all ages. As historian, poet, philosopher, general of armies, and legislator, he stands without peer. So all Moses has to do in Egypt is to mind his pleases and thank yous to Pharaoh and to other court officials, and he will live a life of aristocratic ease. But then, then he goes on and does a terrible thing. And that finished his 40 years in Egypt. Because as he looks around where some Hebrew slaves are laying bricks for the latest addition to Pharaoh's already elaborate mansion, he sees an Egyptian overlord choking and shaking a Hebrew slave and lashing the man. Moses' blood pressure goes up. He cannot take what he sees. He looks both ways to make sure the horizon is clear. And then he unleashes his deadly martial arts attack to the Egyptian overlord and kills him on the spot. Now, the story of his first 40 years is few in words but fat with detail. It doesn't tell us what Moses thinks or feels, just what Moses does. We learn that he is masculine and macho and unafraid. We learn that he might be a little impulsive and that his motto might be ready, fire, aim. And we are reminded that he is black belt in many martial arts discipline. And we learn that he has a natural, deeply felt sense of fair play, that he aches for justice that he has a large heart for the underdog, that as far as Moses is concerned, blood is thicker than water and would rather be a slave among the Hebrews than a prince among the Egyptians. And so we now discover that Moses 
never forgets his mother's teaching. He is an Israelite, not an Egyptian, and never becomes brainwashed by the Egyptian educational system. He never forgets his true background and the one true God. That is what the text in Hebrews is telling us, because we read by faith Moses when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. But may I ask the question here, is it God's plan that Moses explodes into anger and kills the Egyptian taskmaster in no time? Remember Joseph in Egypt. You see, God placed Joseph into a leadership position in Egypt so he could save Jacob and all his family from drought and from famine. Was it God who put hatred and jealousy into the hearts of Joseph's brothers? Now, was it God's plan that they sold him to become a slave in Egypt? Not at all. You see, people are bent to do evil anyway as free moral beings. But here's the point. God can work out something good out of something bad. Now, in Moses' case, in spite of the evil around, God skillfully blends all the seemingly impossible circumstances surrounding his early life so that he too, like Joseph, can end up in the courts of Pharaoh. And so God worked out all the events despite all the dead ends the evil motives, the killings, the impossible circumstances. Because God's wisdom is so creative, but it finds ways to fulfill its wisest purpose. And so God saved the young Moses to be in the courts of Pharaoh, just like Joseph. Now Moses is a prince, but he did a dumb thing. Did I say dumb? Oh yes. He killed the Egyptian taskmaster with his own hands. And killing the Egyptian wasn't God's plan. It was a terrible mistake. And so he had no choice but to flee from Egypt. So goodbye royal robes, goodbye royal palace, goodbye royal life. He fled to Median, where he becomes a fugitive from justice. Now how far is Median? It is so far, far away from Pharaoh's MI6 and CIA, out in the middle of nowhere that no Egyptian will be able to follow. And that's where Moses stays for his second 40 years. Don't you think Moses must have thought, oh boy, I just messed up my wonderful life. A huge mistake. But you see, God's grace and His love is so tremendous that God doesn't just easily give up on us. You see, Moses ran away. But before Moses could reach Midian, God was already there. And you know what happens next? He saw Jethro's daughters bullied by men at the well and Moses alone walking all the way in the desert all this time, summon all his energy to defend the ladies at the well. After all, he is a far skillful in combat than any of those men. Then one thing led to another, and Moses married Zipporah, one of Jethro's daughters, and Moses also married Jethro's sheep. So this is Moses. This prince of Egypt, this sophisticated, educated leader of the most advanced nation on earth, now spends 40 years working for his father-in-law, herding the sheep. This is certainly underemployment worse than being furloughed due to COVID-19. He missed up, he did a dumb thing, and so God gave him dumb animals to tend. Don't you know that sheep are always thought to be among the dumbest animals on earth? Sheep are natural followers. They look around and spot another sheep moving. They then assume that the other sheep moving on must know where the fresh grass is, and they follow. If a sheep thinks you look like you know where you're going, it will follow you. They have a very narrow field of vision, and they have selective vision. Sheep literally see only what they want to see. They don't know anything about precaution. A while back now, a newspaper in Turkey reported that nearly 1,500 sheep jumped onto a cliff. First, one sheep jumped to its death, then stunned Turkish shepherds who left the flock to graze there while they ate their breakfast, watched as nearly 1,500 sheep followed each other, leaping off onto the same cliff. In the end, out of the 1,500 sheep that jumped, 450 were dead as they lay on top of one another 
in a massive white pile. Those that jumped later were saved as the pile got higher and their fall more cautioned. When the Bible says, All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way. We need to realize that these are very strong words to describe how helpless and how stupid we are when we choose to have our own way. And so Moses is isolated for 40 years in Midian. 40 years of furlough, 40 years of isolation. It is 40 years of tedious work, 40 years of a lowly job as shepherd. You are consumed by the heat during the day and you are frozen by the cold at night. It's quite long. A year in the palace of Egypt is a year to the mountains in the wilderness of Midian. 40 years. We are now almost a year since we are told to stay home in this pandemic. We can't do anything about it. Some people somewhere did some dumb thing that brought about this virus, but whether it is carelessness or intentional, we are where we are. We are here right now. And some of us are furloughed. Some have lost jobs. Still others have gone bankrupt. Others are laid to rest. You see, when people deviate from God's intention, disasters follow. And sadly, anyone can be a collateral damage, whether they are young or old, male or female, sinner or saint. Now Moses in isolation for 40 years, not because of the virus, but because of his wrongdoing. It is because of his sin. He puts matters in his own hands. He lost his opportunity as an influence in Egypt similar to that of Joseph. 40 years in isolation in the desert. What a waste of time, you may say. Yes, it is a waste of time if God did not intervene. But because God intervened, it turned out that these 40 years are necessary for God to undo him, to equip him, and to qualify him to lead God's people. 40 years as prince in the courts of Pharaoh did not qualify Moses. Because in God's service, it requires more than just knowledge and skills. It requires character. Don't ever despise your job if you still have one. The responsibilities that you have now are but just stepping stones for responsibilities in the future. It is not helpful if you keep on mourning if you have lost your job, or if what we do is just complain about the circumstances surrounding the lockdown. Whatever we are in now, it is an opportunity for God to shape us and to mold our character and personality so that by the end of these trials, we will come out as better people. There are times when God will allow us to go to a distance and wander into the desert, then into the isolation in Median. For if you are attentive, you will discover God's presence even in Median. The place of isolation becomes the place where God intervenes into our imperfect lives. And so God banished Moses in time. He banished him into mediocrity, banished him into hard life, banished him 40 years in media. But here we can see that God is ever faithful. He reaches to where Moses is. He comes down to his level. He intervenes into the life of Moses in the middle of nowhere. It was Moses' choice to kill the Egyptian. It was Moses' choice to run into Midian. Never God's plan. But then it was God who blended and weaved Moses' mistakes, that even his mistakes could become part of God's overall plan for good, not just for his personal life, but for the lives of all other people. You see, God's plan is bigger and wiser than our personal plans. God always has a plan. And in his wisdom, he enlists people to be on that plan. And when people mess up, when evil plays out, God still works out ways that, despite the mess, that are now embedded in the process, contributed by the imperfect lives of people who play their roles out of their own volition as free moral beings. Despite all of that, the overall outcome remains to be an honor to God and consistently aligns with His wisest purpose. That is why the scripture says, all things work together for good. All things, including the bad things. The bad things are not originally parts of it. 
but because of evil actions and erroneous choices, because of imperfections brought about by sin, God had to deal with all these mixes, blend them together, and bend the outcome to become miraculously good. You see, if we look at circumstances in isolation, they make no sense whatsoever. But when Paul says, for we know that all things work together for good, that phrase there, work together, two words in English, is actually only one word in Greek, and that is the word sonergon. We get our English word synergy from it. And what is synergy, by the way? Synergy or sonergon is what happens when two or more elements are put together to form or to produce something brand new that none of the individual elements could form or produce if they were put separately. Work together. It's what happens when the soup committee goes into the kitchen and makes a big pot of soup. They put in the carrots, the potatoes, the celery, the green onion, the turnips, the spices, and a few other secret ingredients I know nothing about. And what comes out is an excellent soup. I would never eat an onion or powder or spices all by itself. I would never eat the raw potatoes. But once the green onion or the spices and all the other ingredients are now in the soup together with water, with heat brought by the fire, so that they combine them together because the cook put them to work together, the result is gastronomic delight. And that's synergy. That is the one word for work together. The combination of many elements to produce a positive, wonderful result. And so God causes all things work together. Many of the things that make no sense when seen in isolation are in fact working together with other things to produce something good in my life and in your life. There is a divine synergy even in darkest moments. A synergy which produces something positive and that good, that goodness that is ultimately produced as a result could not happen any other way. Consider the work of this sculptor. He begins by choosing a rough chunk of wood. He intends to make from it a beautiful statue. In his mind, he knows exactly what he will do. He predestines this unsightly wood to become an image of beauty. And that determination guides everything that he does. He cuts and chips and chisels. He will remain at the task until it is finished. And in the end, what started as an unsightly wood has become a thing of beauty. In the same way, God is at work in our lives. We are rough and uncut. And God is patiently chipping away some things out of you and of me. It can get rough, but in the end, it will work out to be beautiful. Because anything, anything that God touches becomes a breath taking beauty, the beauty of character, transforming you and me into the likeness of God's Son, Jesus. Forty years in Median, forty years of isolation, forty years of underemployment, forty years of tedious work, forty years is lots of time, lots of time but not a loss of time, because God has the ability to make the best out of it. The habits of caretaking, of self-forgetfulness, and tender solitude for his flock would prepare him to become the compassionate, long-suffering shepherd of Israel. And so now, I ask you, what is your median? Is it years of hardship? Is it years of underemployment? Is it years of minimum wage? Is it years of following orders? Is it years in a tedious marriage? Is it years in a wheelchair? Is it years of loneliness? Is your median all about the passing away of a loved one? What is your median? And for the most of us, this current lockdown is our median. Many have died. They could be our loved ones. It is hard in median, but it is not the end. Think of it as a preparation. Think of it as a refining process because God is preparing us of whatever is next because God, with God, there is always something next because God can turn the backside of the desert 
and wilderness of Midian into a garden of productive spiritual retreat where we can grow and mature and flourish. You see, it was there in Midian that Moses' pride and self-sufficiency were swept away. He became patient, he became reverent and humble. It was there in Midian, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that he wrote the book of Genesis, and it is believed the book of Job. Forty years in Midian, no human training or culture could be substitute for this experience. It was in this desert of isolation that God made him the meekest man in his time. Midian prepared him to engage in the toughest job for God. Midian sets him to become instrumental in the greatest wonders in the history of the Israelites. The Red Sea he opened, fresh water when they're thirsty, manna fell from heaven, and many more. We can see a glaring theme here that before God can use you, He fixes you. But He can only fix you when you spend time with Him personally in your region. When that is the case, He will mold you in your median of circumstances. Because with God, there is always something more, something beyond, some mission yet to be faithful to. That moment after meeting God in that lonely wilderness, Moses marches back to Pharaoh's palace where he was once a prince and demands on behalf of God, let my people go. And so the Exodus happened. And what's next? You know, I really thought Moses will make it to Canaan. But sadly, in his anger, he struck the rock with a rod in his hand, and with that, he couldn't reach the promised land. Now, that's a bit rough, wouldn't you say? After all, Moses' sin doesn't seem to be all that bad. And he rested and died at Mount Nebo. He didn't enter the promised land. Is that good or bad? Well, remember, all things work together for good. He did not make it to Canaan. But there is a better Canaan for Moses, far greater than the earthly one. How? Well, you look at Jude. Jude 1.9, yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. And so here Jesus rebuked the devil. He was objecting about Moses. He claimed Moses. Jesus rebuked him. The Lord wants him to fly now because Jesus will just pay him later. It's like a buy now, pay later. The pre-incarnate Christ came to raise the body of his friend Moses. He could not enter the earthly Canaan. Moses pleaded and pleaded before he died, pleaded, Sovereign Lord, let me go over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, that fine hill, country, and Lebanon. The Lord's reply did not speak to me anymore about this matter. It seems so harsh. You wouldn't be able to understand that. That does not sound good at all. But now, now I get to understand. He has got to go to the ultimate promised land. Not the earthly one, but the heavenly one. Moses was physically redeemed by the Lamb who is yet to be slain in the future, some 1,300 years later. After this encounter at the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus was transfigured in that mountain. Peter, James, and John saw him with Moses on one side and Elijah on the other side. Elijah represents those whom God will bring to heaven without seeing death. For Moses, those who will go through the valley of death. But most of all, it was Elijah and Moses, both of them, that Christ needed because only them, not the angels, understood with experience how to walk with God in faith and how to shepherd God's flock, unruly flock. Christ Jesus, who needs to save humanity, needs to incarnate, and by that word, He needs to become human too. Christ's humanity, to save the lost humanity, needed some affirmation from two human beings, and Moses is one of them, because the incarnated Jesus must experience extreme hardships, disappointments, loneliness, frustrations, and rejection. And so when Paul says that, all things work together for good. He is not saying that the tragedies and the heartaches of life will always produce a better set of circumstances. No. Sometimes they do. Many times they don't. 
But God is not committed to just making us healthy and wealthy only here right now. He is committed to making us in the likeness of His Son, Christ Jesus. And whatever it takes to make you more like Jesus, it is good. And everything that happens to you, the tragedies, the unexplained circumstances, even the mistakes and the wrong choices that we or others make, all of it are taken by God. All is poured into that creative mill so that they blend and the divine synergy works. And what that synergy provides becomes part of God's loving purpose. There are so many complex threads crisscrossing, overlapping, touching, zigzagging, overlaying. But in the end, God is able to produce a beautiful tapestry out of them. And despite, because He is all wise, He is all loving, and He is faithful. God bends the destiny of lost humanity and points it to His wonderful purpose. And though sometimes it may seem this world is in control, yet He is still the King of kings and Lord of lords. For Moses, this 40 best years is spent here in Midian. No Midian, no exodus. No Midian, no meekness. No Midian, no burning bush. No Midian, no leadership. Midian is difficult. It's difficult, but God is there. And God wants to meet you there. God wants you to meet Him in your median of difficulties. Because if you see Him there, it is sure that He will go with you all the way to something brighter, far greater and far grander than you have imagined. All things work together for good. To them that love God. To them who are the called. According to his purpose. God bless you. Father, that you know from the beginning to the end, thank you that you allow us to participate and to make our choices 
um, in this conflict between good and evil. We pray, Lord, that we will continue to choose on the side of Jesus. And thank you, Lord, that you will empower us to do what is good and what is right. And thank you that you have intervened into our individual lives so that we will be brought from darkness into your marvelous light. In the name of Jesus, we trust. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor, very much for the message. Thank you for encouraging us to re recognize that God is there in our lives, whether it's good or bad, whether we are achieving what we have set out to do or whether we have, we have not achieved it yet. You know, but whatever the case is, God is with us. So thank you very much for reminding us. And going back to the Sabbath school lesson, that should give us comfort, you see. That should give us comfort that God is there with us, you know. And uh, I just want us to remember that, you know, Philippians tell us that whatever situation we find ourselves in, he said we must learn to be contented, mm -hmm. you know. And as we do that, you know, we will find that our life with the Lord will grow much better, you know, and nothing will bother us. We will be able to go through with a sound mind at the end of the day. So thank you very much, Pastor, for what you are, the, allowing the Lord, rather, to use you to bring that message home to us. God bless you. Thank you, and uh, God bless you all.